Welcome back to the Impact Driven Leader Podcast. This is your host, Tyler Dickerhoff. If you're watching on YouTube, spectacular. Good to see you. Glad you're here. If you're listening, wherever you listen to podcasts, I'm glad to have you as well. Thanks for tuning into this episode where I sit down and have a conversation with author leader Sue Dyer. Sue is a author of the book, The Trusted Leader. She has a tremendous amount of experience in the construction industry. And she has done tremendous work in really kind of codifying and breaking down how to be a trusted leader. Now, she goes through in this episode describing a trusted leader and explaining on the continuum of a leadership this idea of, you know, there's the feared leader, there's the boss, there's a capable manager, there's a good leader, and then ultimately a trusted leader. She and I discussed that. And really, what is a feared leader? What, how do they go about their job leading and I would say, even as Sue said as well, a feared leader is not really a leader. It might be a dictator, might be an authoritarian, but not a leader. A trusted leader is actually a leader. So we discuss that. We also break down this big change, something that I haven't contemplated. How the effect of healthy leadership, this trusted leader, impacts artificial intelligence. How it affects the impact of artificial intelligence in our world and how paramount it is to have healthy leadership codifying and developing that artificial intelligence. A, a, a strange tangent, but man, so much great, valuable information as well. Sue shares about a uh, free assessment that she has uh, with the trusted leader. So look for those in the show notes. I'll wrap up with you in the end, take all the notes and describe it all. But uh, uh, excited to have this conversation with Sue Dyer. And me? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. You know, we we just chatted a little bit there in uh, before I hit record, and I'm excited to talk about this book, the uh, the trusted leader that I was exposed to. I was able to get through it, and I think what you really kind of identify and that I grasp is not this foreign concept, this foreign concept of a different type of leadership, but yet you describe it in such a way that y you were saying right before I hit record that our world needs this. And I agree. The biggest area that I think leadership has to improve is going from being a feared leader, as you describe in your book, to a trusted leader. So I'd love for you to just jump in there. You know, it, it's absolutely true. It's been my life's work to do this. And of course, I focused mostly in construction because it was highly adversarial and it's where I was using it as a living laboratory. But if you look at the world today, and how interdependent we are. And all you have to do is look at the map of how the COVID virus spread to see visually how interdependent we are. Mm -hmm. and, and then economically with all of the, you can't get a part for this car, you can't finish this, can't plant that, can't, you know, we are interdependent. And yeah. in that type of relationship, if you have a high fear relationship, it is a lose, lose situation. And so I think that our models of leadership have not kept up with the actual way that the world has changed. And we must move to a trusted leadership model. And okay. as technology and AI take over, AI does not have a conscience. AI doesn't care about you and it doesn't care about me. So it's going to be the leaders that determine what the future will be. And my hope and prayer is that those will be leaders that will be high trust leaders. So you, um, there's a lot in, in that, you know, little 30, 60, you know, 75 seconds that you shared. And I, I want to make sure that I, I, I piece this along properly because I think it's going to build on each other from a foundational point of view and then give us this really rich topic to discuss. So I want to hear from you first. Describe in your words the either the, the difference or the definition of a feared leader and a trusted leader. Okay. So a feared leader is someone who people are afraid of telling the truth and they end up creating an atmosphere where punishment is involved if you don't do what you're told. 
And sometimes it seems obscure, but when you actually ask the people in that group, what's the punishment, they can tell you. And this isn't written in some manual somewhere. So a feared leader is someone who uh, creates this atmosphere of punishment and they want everyone just to comply. Mm. And what, what I like to tell people is compliance doesn't mean that they're actually following you, that they yeah. actually, they're just complying. Yeah. But what happens in your business or in your government when everyone's just complying is that when a big problem pops up, People see it. They're smart. They can figure out what to do, but they don't act. No, they're, they're paralyzed. Orders. They're taking an order. You didn't give me an order. Therefore, I'm not acting. And They've so been conditioned I, to that, right? Well, they get punished if they don't do it. Yeah. yeah. So they're absolutely conditioned to it. And also communication doesn't flow. Because communication is one of those things that, well, I, if I stick my neck out and say my truth, I may get punished. So I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. So I've seen that lead to the destruction of companies, of projects, of teams, of whole organizations over and over. And in construction, that's been our model for over a hundred years. Yeah. And we are the only industry that has gone down in productivity points for 50 years. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it also probably lent into this idea of, you know, I come from what I would say blue collar. I come from a background in agriculture. And, you know, for many, many years, it was like, oh, you know, do something better than doing physical labor. And, yes. and some of it growing up on a farm, being around it, it's like it can be very fear based leadership because that was just the model that perpetuated without business efficiency. That's just the way that it held through. The interesting part there that I want to go back and kind of correlate with you know where people are at is a lot of times the feared leader is not actively doing anything today that is calling people out and eliciting fear it was things done before and you know there's a um a story that had been told about these monkeys and they respond and yet no one understands why the monkeys don't want to climb this pole it's because one monkey got shot with water but yet none of those monkeys that are left in the room got shot with water and i believe that that description of the feared leader happens People walk into an organization and maybe they've never gotten yelled at or maybe they've never been wildly punished, but yet there's this organizational fear because it was passed along even though the leader isn't actively doing anything. Have, have you seen uh, that? I, yes, and it's actually you're, – you're, it's also norms. So the norms, yeah. it's the culture, right? It's the yeah. culture, the norms. And so norms are very powerful. And when you walk into a team or a business, you walk into their norms. And, and what is norms say? Norms is what is normal behavior in this situation, right? Yeah. So yeah. these norms exist. And, and so people just act to the norms. That's why if you really want to change things, you have to change the values. Yes. So that, that changes the attitudes, it changes the behaviors. So let's so, then jump from the feared leader to the trusted leader. So a trusted leader, in my opinion, is someone who people are willing to follow and, and want to follow. At least they're willing to follow. So to me, a leader is not a leader unless people are willing to follow. That's the definition of a leader. Yeah. And if people aren't willing to follow you, then you're really not stepping up and leading. And so in a trusted leader business or team, uh, I'm there and I feel as though I can trust this person and I trust that they are going to take us somewhere that will be meaningful. And so I feel like I'm choosing to be a part of this and so does everyone else. So pretty quickly, you begin to feel like this sense of teamwork, this cohesion that mm -hmm. we're in something together, we're doing this together. And then that allows us to be committed to our leader, to our mission, to each other, and really to doing whatever it takes. And it's, now you set up the atmosphere that allows for innovation, creativity, breakthroughs to happen. So would you say different. trust happens in the absence of fear or in spite of fear? 
Uh, I don't believe that fear and trust can coexist. It's yeah. sort of like if you turn a light in a room, it's not there yeah. anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I do not believe they can coexist. I think to the extent that you have fear, you, you're pushing out trust. And to the extent that you have trust, you're pushing out fear. So you can either go by trying to drive out fear or you can go by trying to increase trust and maybe you do both things so yeah. that you can increase the level of trust you have. And I think, you know, kind of as I, as I try to piece that together and I think what I, what I hear and what I, I gain is, you know, a, le- a trusted leader, if a trusted leader, a leader who wants trust and wants to do the best and, and practice with, you know, empathy is all of their actions should be moving to mitigate or reduce fear in their own actions and within everyone else. If I am moving towards being a trusted leader, what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I'm doing whatever. So fear subsides. So I build confidence. I build comfort. That's going to inherently move me to a point of being trusted. hundred percent. That is your job as a leader is to build the atmosphere and to continuously break up the fear, press it out, create a psychological safety, create the ability for team people to come together, for you to tap into the collective wisdom of your entire group. It's fun once you get there, but it actually is that's the job of a leader. And also, I'll say leadership isn't just for the person with the authority. Yeah. You need leadership everywhere throughout your whole business. Can you imagine if everyone was committed to being a trusted leader throughout your whole organization? Mm -hmm. Then you're going to lead a conversation. You're going to lead a meeting. You're going to lead an initiative. You're going to lead a project. Everyone leads at some point. So you're going to want everyone to, to take that role. And what a powerful dynamic uh, you business you would have, but I also think that it comes down to taking ownership also. So when you're when you feel like you're a leader, you own the problem, you own the solution, you own what you're going to do, and that's what I see doesn't happen on the feared leaders. You're an order taker. You're waiting for someone else to decide and tell you what to do instead of saying, "Let's come up with five ways to solve this yeah. and pick the best one." Yeah, yeah. Being being even though it's not my problem. I'm going to engage in it if it doesn't help us, you know, complete our project or doesn't help us, you know, succeed on our mission. I, I think there's a story that, you know, a, a lot of times innovation comes from, you know, a, a different part of the organization that's willing to be engaged in the entire problem to say, hey, I see this from a totally different angle. And maybe that can offer some insight. And it's amazing that organizations that work that way, that they come up with such creative, innovative ideas. And there isn't someone that's afraid of, oh, you took my spotlight. Exactly. But what you can do as a leader is you can create these forums for this to happen where you you cross-pollinate people yeah. in the room so Every stakeholder with every different perspective is there, and then they share their perspectives, and together they co-create a solution that's just really extraordinary. And then because they help to create it, they don't argue with it. Yeah. It actually gets implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think you describe this a lot in your book, The Trusted Leader, is that moving towards having trust is really taking on a mindset of co-creation. It's not a, you know, a singular, I have to be the one, I have to own it all, it's all on me. It is really this idea of a, I am going to co-create with everyone. I think as you describe it, which is such a great way, is one plus one equals, you know, 30. One plus one equals so much more than just two. It's not following that zero sum, well, we'll compromise, meet in the middle. No, we'll add on to each other. Well, then it produces extraordinary results. Uh, w- one story I have around that is I work with the Oakland International Airport. This is just one project that's done this, but uh, they were going to rebuild the main runway for the airport. And for most airports, that would take a year and a half, two years, and be very uh, difficult for operations during the time. If you can imagine how structurally that has to be sound with planes of yeah. a million found you're hitting it so uh, at oakland airport they wanted to rebuild their runway 
And this team of high performing high performers came together and they decided that they were going to build it in two weeks. Now that's a two a two year project in two weeks. So uh, they figured out, you know, they started figuring out the technology. How are we going to get the, the, all the all the trucks in there? How are we going to get access? It's also a secure environment, so you have to go through security. And so, you know, a lot of that stuff. How do you pay that? They did two million dollars a day of work. Two million dollars a day. How do you pay a company? You can't pay them once a month, right? Yeah. So. So they, we have pre-agreed on the quantities for each day, and then they pre-cut checks. And this is in a public entity. And so they, and then we had a, we had a schedule that they put across the entire wall in five-minute increments, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for two weeks. And they, and it wasn't like it was easy. They had uh, on a freeway nearby. They had a truck that blew up and burnt down the bridge. So they had all these trucks that were backed up and couldn't get to the project. Uh, they had a few other little mishaps here and there, but they got that entire project paved in two weeks, $2 million a day. Now, before this, everyone would have said that's totally, absolutely impossible. But that is what a high-performing team can achieve. They can do what other people think are impossible, and I see it all the time. I have projects that do a million dollars a day. I have projects where we have we have program design, built, activate, and open an entire airport section, a million square feet in eighteen months. Uh, we built we built towers. We built these are things that are just extraordinary. And of course, the cost savings are somewhere between ten and forty percent. So it's. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty extraordinary. So I, I just see what trusted leaders and yeah. trusted leadership can do for any kind of business. And so you mentioned this and in, in, in part of that first opening little segment that we have a world now that demands that we move to a trusted leadership, you know, kind of um, ethos and operation. It, it needs to be. And it's been – to me, it, it, we've seen this struggle over the last, I don't know, how many ever years that we blame it on generations. They're soft. They're entitled. You know what? They're, they're expecting something that just is not the norm. But yet, to me, it's, it's no what our society is expecting is to be treated with dignity and respect in humanity. And yet, it, it becomes this great, like, confusion. Well – is that what is expected of a leader or is that what our world is asking for? To me, that's what, uh, that I see this kind of this, this juxtaposition from a move of a leadership style to now a more up-to-date leadership style that's saying, no, we need to operate differently. How do you see all of that? And you kind of mentioned that earlier that now our society is, is demanding that we have a different type of leadership. Well, I think there's two different things I would say about that. One is that the leadership styles that need to evolve because of what's occurring are not really intuitive, ob intuitively obvious to everyone, and they don't realize they're undermining themselves. And so they start to be fearful because they see the changes, right? So they begin to be, become fearful and then they become more fearful, and so they become more controlling, and it gets to be this vicious cycle. And instead of realizing, no, you need to put down your sword and stop protecting or policing and talk to each other yeah. and, and get to know each other, understand your perspective, understand my perspective, because when you're interdependent, it's a lose-lose or win-win, and I can't tell you how many business leaders and government leaders are actually negotiating over who's going to lose more. That is still a loss. Mm -hmm. And so I think the world has fundamentally changed, and I don't see, unless all the technology gets turned off, which I don't think it will, and I think we're not that far off from the singularity event I think that leadership has to evolve to what will be the future 
which will be highly interdependent. And in an interdependent relationship, you have to have a high trust relationship. And I, I just think that's essential. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I still don't think most leaders are seeing that, especially business leaders, because they look at their marketplace and they think, oh, these are my competitors. And okay, they might be, but let's look at a bigger picture. And beyond that and say, you know, even with your competitors, you're interdependent in your industry. Totally. Yeah, you're interdependent yeah. with your customers. Yeah. So you just have to look at that. And I just think the yeah. world is evolving towards that. Yeah. Not, a, It's not going to change. So, you know, and I guess one of the, the questions I would ask is, a, is a trusted leader a healthy leader? And when I describe healthy, it's a, it's a leader that's moving towards, you know, being, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, relationally healthy, whereas you have a, a balance of, of a healthy quotient there. You, we can break apart what healthy is, but I think you can hopefully understand those listening can understand to move towards that healthy. There is no pinnacle, but it's a move towards it. Is a, is a trusted leader healthy, whereas a feared leader, because you described almost this little bit of insecurity there, where a feared leader has this, you know, kind of held in unhealthiness. Maybe that's emotionally, that is a barrier for them to be able to be the trusted leader. Well, uh, for sure, every time any of us, and of course, all of us at some point could become a feared leader, and I'm... Yeah. Yeah, I'm walking into something brand new. It's a risky yeah. deal. We could be feared, and then, but then we need to figure out: Do we let the fear dis decide, or do we let the? Tr we're gonna, no, I'm going to just trust. I'm going to trust yeah. my people. I'm going to trust what's happening. And I do think that it's a psychological health that has to be there. Uh, and none of us are, you know, it's it's not a black and white thing. Yeah, <laughs> none yeah. all of us can be uh, ogres at time. I'm sure. And do things we're not proud of. But I think a healthy mind uh, is important. And I think with a healthy body comes a healthy mind to the extent that you can. Um, some people, I know my daughter is disabled, so she does yeah. the best she can. But yeah, totally. uh, I think it's a matter of trying to be the best that you can be and be yeah. for, for your people, not for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it's... And to me, that, that kind of dovetails into the, the last little segment is the idea of understanding that, that I need to be healthy for others in order for the best of them is exempt from artificial intelligence. So there is not this understanding of, you know, it, it's, I have not seen it. Maybe they're developing it to where AI can, can read nonverbal language can understand, Hey, what is, what may be actually not beneficial for me may be beneficial for someone else, which is holistically better for all of us. And, and to me, that's, what's interesting in this idea of, yes, I believe we could program AI to get there, but only if the programmer understands and comprehends that if the programmer does not understand that, and it thinks that, you know, this idea of artificial intelligence will fix everything. And we're missing out on the, the, this real quotient of being a trusted leader and what that all entails. Do we run into problems when that AI does not comprehend that? Well, absolutely. AI needs to be programmed by people who are trusting and who care. And I think the other side of it is, is that AI to me needs to serve humanity, mm. not replace humanity. And so that means the decision making, you, you may get data and you may get, you may get information so that you can make a decision, a decision point, but that will be up to the trusted leaders to make that for their people, w whether it's a government or whether it's a business or a team or a project. Uh, yeah. I think it's going to be the leaders of the future, just like the leaders of the past, that determine the outcomes of what will happen. Yeah, I, I think it, it, you know, and again, I, I enjoy the fact that you brought that up because it's it's something that I hadn't necessarily comprehended and, and contemplated and, and sat down and really digested this idea that as we see more and more artificial intelligence, as that becomes 
a key piece and component of every industry, right? Every industry that the effectiveness to towards positivity is actually in the code for that AI. And, you know, that we come to the, the world that, you know, do we end up having run by machines to where it's a, you know, antagonistic rather than a complementary part of our leadership. I think that's a very, could go very, very deep in that conversation. And there can be unintended consequences. Look at what we already have today. Yeah. In the algorithms that were created for commerce that are now being used in a political arena to give people information of whatever they want. It's not necessarily the truth. And there seems to be no ability to find what is the truth anymore. Yeah. And it was just an unintended consequence of how they wrote the algorithms. Yeah. And so that's just one area. Yeah. It, it, it's again, uh, when you think about that and, and overlay it on this idea of being a trusted leader and are you doing, you know, to your comment here, are you doing the best for people for the best of people, you know, serving humanity rather than trying to replace because, oh, I have a better solution. We'd be better off without the, um, I would say the, uh, the intricacies of humanity. And to me, that is the biggest evolution for moving from a feared leader to a trusted leader. And my own journey is understanding all the intricacies of humanity is all the things to enjoy, embrace, and trust. And the if you don't accept those intricacies, that's actually where you become very fearful because you're trying to control it for your own viewpoint, your own benefit. And in your business uh, – when you actually run models and we, I have, uh, there's five different uh, university level research projects that have been done on my models. And it shows that your cost savings or profit is yeah. somewhere between five to 10% typically. Uh, and you say, and you save time as well. There's uh, other research that was done that shows that um, when you enter into a relationship, a business relationship, and you expect to have a high trust relationship, you actually end up earning two thirds more and, than you do when you enter in, when you're yeah. in a protective mode. Yeah. Just that open relationship, high probability that if in an interaction, in a negotiation, you're trusting, high probability, like 98%, that you're going to get that in return. So you have to think about how you are creating your own outcomes in your business simply by how you are going into it with your mindset. So, Which is why the book talks about mindset and yeah. value. So the mindset is the principles that create the 10 intentions and then the values, which are six partnering values that create a high trust environment or well, culture. And I believe in a, in a leadership perspective. That's one of the, the biggest roles of a leader is to identify, live, breathe the values and communicate a, a vision that is worthwhile to everyone. It, it's not just what's good for me. It has to be good for the whole or no one's going to want to follow. No one's want, going to want to, you know, going back to one of the words that you said earlier, choose to own that, take ownership in order to be innovative and creative towards that solution. Because at some point you're going to come to a bridge that gets burnt down because of a truck blew up. And what can we do to make sure that we can innovate and be creative through that process to find the solution that's going to allow you to accomplish what no one else thought you could. Yeah. I, I'm just reading a Harvard business review today and they were talking about research that had been done about uh, leadership. Let me grab it over here and I'll show you. I, I dog-eared it. Today. You can see. I dog-eared it right here. And it was so interesting because they were talking about how uh, they discovered, they were, this is all about values. And this is, this is really, my model is all about alignment. Mm -hmm. I call it the nozzle effect. Yeah. And they're talking about businesses that were not aligned with their values were 40% less effective. Absolutely. Harvard Business Review on page 41. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it really, it, well, and I think this is what's interesting about that is, you know, it, we go back into that little piece that you said is our world's demanding it. And I think this is what's interesting in, in the workplace. You look at, you know, I'm in my 40s. I'm in this, you know, crossover between, you know, millennial Gen X, more on the Gen X side. But you, you have a lot of people that are in that position of leadership and much younger that are kind of looking at our predecessors to say, hmm, how many people actually live the values that they said? Two, how many of them created values because that was what needed to be done? You just need to plaster those up on the wall. And that means that you're, you're doing the right thing for your customers into your you know employees or the people that chose to say huh what do we want to be about why do we want to serve people and what's really important so when we come to a decision and it's going to challenge our integrity what values do we hold on to that make sure we make the right decisions and i think that's this what's what's driven people to say nope we need better because there's been a lot of pretenders, a lot of people saying one thing and acting totally different. And I think that's what comes back to, you know, that, that quote that you made is that the companies that actually lived it did a lot better than the ones that just said it. Yeah, just setting it on a piece of paper is, is a, doesn't help. It's got to be aligned with a vision, with a strategy, with a structure, and with your values, which is your culture. And, and then you've got to attract the people who are in sync with that as well. Yeah. So then Absolutely. you get that kind of alignment. You just, you just blast off. Yeah. yeah. It, it's amazing how it, 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 you almost, it, it's kind of one of those things that you have to almost live it to appreciate the, how dynamic it really is. That's probably true. It's probably true. You know, it's, it's interesting too thinking about generationally, uh, it was interesting because my father uh, was graduated from high school in 1942. Uh, that was, you know, World War II just yeah. starting. He had had polio, so he was 4F, so he couldn't be drafted. And people on the street would point at him and laugh at him and say, what are you doing? My son is at the war. Why aren't you at the war? Uh, and uh, eventually he joined the Merchant Marines and got blown up in the ship three times and floated around in the ocean. But, you know, those kind of events like that, I think, define generations. Yeah. You know, what are the things that are happening at the time? And I think in our generations now, well, COVID, I know, is going to affect this totally. younger generation. I already see it happening. Uh, but it's those things that technologies allowing us to be closer to each other, connected. There's not the differences that it used to be. Um, any part in the world seems close to us now. It doesn't seem far away. Plus, there are trade partners. So the world has become our family. Yeah. And if we're not consistent with that in our values, that's not going to be a good thing for the world. Well, it I, I'm not sure if you've read the book. Um, I had the pleasure to interview Jason Dorsey, who wrote Z Economy. And, and out of his work, he I, has identified that, you know, and this was pre-COVID, but I think it still stands true now, is that a 15-year-old in the U.S. and Japan have more in common than a 15-year-old and a 50-year-old in the same country. And, and that's because of this flattening. You talk about the trade partners. And to me, that's one of the great changes that I've seen, I have teenage kids out of, you know, COVID and going forward and talking to their teachers is that we have kids now that have lost a lot of interpersonal skills yes, because they've, they've been behind a screen or they've been able to turn off the camera. They haven't had to interact. And so those interactions, they're actually at school having to navigate through more than they've ever had to because now it's it's front and center. It, it's not as much the academic principles. It's the interpersonal stuff, which I come back to, you know, this idea of a trusted leader. Man, the interpersonal skills are absolutely what it takes is the emotional intelligence, not the technical part of it. Yeah. Any of us that's been in business for a while, we know that's true. Yeah. It's 80% that and 20% the technical stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know my grandson lived with us and he is in high school in these two years. And before that, he got mono. So for him, it was really three years, yeah. four years, 
I, he was at home. And yeah, yeah, it's completely different. I mean, not really interested in driving, not really yep. interested in going anywhere, not really yep. interested in, yeah, it's like, yeah. okay, you know, it, it's, get which- out there. <laughs> Which again, I think comes back to the evolving leader needs to understand that and not expect different. And understanding that means I need to do whatever to be trusted instead of getting frustrated and choosing a fear model and say, I'm just going to make people compliant. Because as you mentioned earlier, and I've seen in my life, compliance does not yield a positive result. Compliance just keeps you afloat. It does not move your boat faster to your destination. Well, I would say it keeps you afloat until it sinks you. <laughs> okay. I, I would agree with you. you. Yes. It is predictable that it will sink will you. will sink you. Yep. yep. I mean, it's sort of like watching Russia attack Ukraine. You have a trusted leader and you have a feared leader. The result is going to be predictable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just win. And it's not if, it's just yes. me. Yeah. Yes. Um, Sue, as you had mentioned to me, there's a, um, you know, you have a, you put together a training series for the trusted leader that's coming out in January. I want yes, to have you talk just real quick about that. So that way the listeners can, to get an idea so they can get prepared for that coming here in 2023. Oh, well, thank you so much. So in 2023, I've been working this whole year on creating a training. It's six modules based on my book, which was a Wall Street Journal bestseller. Yay. Yes. And um, it, it will walk you through step by step how to go from where you are, wherever you are in the continuum, to level up trust. And you will do evaluation of where you are. You'll identify things that where you think you can get your best return on investment for leveling up trust. And over the course of the five modules, you will have identified 10 things where you think you can get a significant return on investment for increasing trust. And then module six takes you into a 30-day 30 30 do the impossible challenge where you'll pick one of those things where you think you can get the biggest ROI and you will go from thinking it's impossible to possible to probable to inevitable over those 30 days by doing daily practice and training your brain to become a high trust brain. And it, a lot of it, we have these neuro pathways we've learned over our childhood mm-hmm. and adulthood. And so you have to retrain those and create some new neuro pathways. Yeah. And so that's really what the training is beginning to help you do. And then you put it into practice to prove to yourself that you can do it now. Yeah. It, you know, to me, that's just a, you know, it's changing the mindset. And I'm, I'm a subscriber to Carol uh, Dweck's work where you can, you know, have a growth mindset. And I believe, I was even talking to someone earlier today, I said, I've had to change my leadership style from being more of a feared or a more insecure or a, you know, just afraid leader to being more of a trusted leader. And I know uh, you have an assessment. I went through it and where you label out on that continuum, the difference between a feared leader to a trusted leader and, you know, each of the spots in between. So um, that link will be in our show notes. Thank you for providing that and kind of being a, a, a identifier as part of that process where you're moving, but also lead you into that training series. Yes, you can see where you fall along the continuum between fear and trusted leadership, and you can share it with your whole team and see where you are as a team. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sue. I appreciate the conversation you spending time with us. Oh, thank you so much for letting me be here and share my, my thoughts with you. I appreciate yeah. it so much. Yeah. As a wrap up to this episode, kind of like to finish with this idea. Sue mentioned that you know, the leadership style that needs to change are kind of those self-defeating one that, you know, those, those leadership styles that they kind of seemingly get pushed back into a corner. So they end up gravitating more and more towards a fear based of leadership. Well, next week, November 14th and 15th, there's still an opportunity for you to register to come join my workshop, the impact driven leader workshop, where I'm going to kind of really walk through this idea of fears and insecurities and how as a leader, they're what are holding you back. Much like what Sue is saying here, the difference between a feared leader and a trusted leader. I'm going to break that down. I'm going to go through that. That's a free workshop. I'd love for you to join to join in on go to the 
impactdrivenleader.com to get the registration link to register for that workshop. I'd love for you to share with anyone. At the same point, if you got value out of today's episode, go check out Sue's work. Go take the free trusted leader assessment. I did so. Um, and I saw some key areas, some, you know, yeah, I'm on the trusted side. Why? Because I've worked hard at it. I can tell you, as I shared in this episode, there was many, many years, many, many days even where I was the feared leader. Part is because my own fears. And I've been able to work through those. I want to help you do that because I know when you're more of a trusted leader, you're an impact driven leader and it's possible. I I've walked that path, continue to walk that. And I'd love to help you do so as always. I'd love for you to share this episode, make this available to those that you care near and dear about. Hopefully it helps them improve and grow in their leadership ability and capability. And lastly, I'd love for you to leave a review, a rating. Let us know how I'm doing. I mean, our team, my team goes through that and, you know, helps me get better. And I'd love to serve you in a bigger way. We're closing in on a hundred episodes Time to start looking to see, you know, how I can get even better. Thanks for being here. Till next time. Have a good one.